Welcome everyone and thank you for coming to our cantata open rehearsal and this afternoon's discussion of cantata BWV3. We're very excited to have with us our principal guest conductor, John Harbison, who is obviously our cantata conductor and will also take us through this fascinating piece. Hi. Uh I need someone to serve as a, uh, um, from the audience usually. Thank you very much. Um, and I want you to just read John 2, 1 to 11 through to about the s number seven, just past the water pots. And then I want to ask you one question. <laughs> On the third day, there was a wait for the wedding. Hold it, hold it. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out some now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. So your question is, oh. <laughs> in that story, what, what jumps out of you most? Bach is going to ask himself that question every time he picks up one of these readings for the day as sort of a launch point for his cantata. And I'm just wondering what you think might have been striking to him. There are a lot of possibilities, of course. Just well, just that um, when there was a problem, she, they said, go to him, and he'll fix it. So he, first miracle. Yeah. So, right, that's often what is known about this particular incident. It's Jesus coming out on his, into the public and performing his first miracle. The line which, which grabbed Bach, and it's interesting, I, what you, your answer is, I think, right on in terms of thinking about the, the larger narrative in Jesus' progress. The line that struck Bach, and I think that is a rather startling one, and which every painter who, write, who paints this scene does notice, though often as just a very odd detail. Usually in this festive Sur surroundings. Jesus is there with a whole bunch of people. It's one of his biggest, first big social occasions. And Mary is usually weeping. Why? Because of his retort to her. Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour is not yet come. And this is a coming of age moment for Jesus saying, I, I don't need my family. I don't care what you think about this. I'm on my own, and this is my journey. And Mary's sorrow and her realization, her realization of the hard road of Jesus, that he's embarking on a very difficult journey, is what informs the three Bach cantatas on, on this, for this occasion. Um, all of them very differently, because uh, he is, of course, since he comes back to these texts uh, in successive years, he is always thinking of, of things I didn't do the last time. Uh, what, what might I do uh, when I have an occasion once in the church, uh, again in the church calendar to address this very subject? Uh, the first time he takes it on, um, the, uh, the cantata is a chamber cantata, and it's almost like an opera. He has a, a beautiful aria for Mary very sad, lamentational area. He has a wonderful little duet for the people who come to the party. <laughs> and then 
he has a rather uh, hard and, and, and kind of a, uh, address of sort of a stand-in for Jesus about I'm going off on my own. Uh, the next time he sets it, it is uh, um, this one, the one we're in, in the midst of here, uh, where clearly the, the lamentational aspect, the fact that it's going to be a hard journey, comes right away in the first chorus. He's just going to start right there, and he's not going to personify the, the characters nearly as much um, in terms of a kind of an operatic concept. Um, the last time uh, is, uh, in some ways, the most it's, uh, the most dramatic of the of the group, because it is perhaps, in terms of its expression, the most the most violent. Um, but we feel each time that Bach comes back to these pieces, sometimes just a year apart. The thing is, is he's read it again, and he's he's reacting to whatever it is musically that he feels he has to go to. Um, and of course, in this case of this piece, the lamentational aspect of this big first movement is is as much reflective as it is uh, uh, active. It's not. There's. It doesn't seem like. Um, uh, it doesn't seem like it's. Uh, the journey forth is is really uh, is really is really makeable yet. There is that wonderful part at the about three quarters of the way through that chorus where the the, the hard journey is representation is represented in kind of the, the rhythms of the chorus, Schmala, Weg is doch zu schwer, where the the rhythm of the working against the wind almost is is portrayed. But otherwise, uh, the, the, the affect of the piece is established, I think, in much more general terms. Um, and it's interesting to go back to Bach's first setting to see him first dramatizing it in terms of the individual actors in the story, and then never really going back to that approach again in the, in the, next, uh, the next two uh, occasions. Um, when we give these... Uh, we've done a lot of these cantatas, this kind of, not this one, but a lot of cantatas are tangled with, and we always have a, um, a an apprentice uh, journalist, usually studying with Robert Kurzinger. Um, every year someone is assigned to that role. And we have, tend to give those people the, the, uh, the assignment of uh, writing program notes for various of the concerts. And the Bach cantatas are always a tough moment for those for those uh, folks. A couple of them have wound up as daily critics of, of the globe. And, and usually their reaction is they have to somehow explain to the audience what a Bach cantata is, which is usually a tremendously dry <laughs> and, and cumbersome and, 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 and in the end unintelligible <laughs> couple of paragraphs which tends to not come to the specifics of the piece ever because there isn't really a time to do that, just explaining what this thing is and how he did a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, instead of the really the crux of the issue, which is what animated this piece? Why is it different from other pieces? What happened to the composer that he, that he had to come up with this, the shapes and the ideas that you're going to hear? Um, and I have to say that, that this sort of translation problem of what is a Bach, what is it, what, what happens in a Bach cantata is one of the hardest things to convey to an audience for which they are often a, a novel experience in a concert hall. Um, they are not exactly, strictly speaking, dramatic works, but they are certainly dramatizations of situations that are extremely vital. Um, and it's interesting that uh, the, in the visual arts world, pr there, there are probably more paintings of the marriage of Cana than any other biblical incident except the nativity and, and the crucifixion. Marriage of Cana is loved by painters of every period because you can get an awful lot of people out there. <laughs> you can get the principles sort of at, at least, uh, you know, positioned such that they might make some impression. But basically you have splendid tables and unbelievable architecture. And, and uh, the largest painting in the world, I found in my research, is the marriage of Cana. It's in the Louvre. Uh, it's a chance for the painter to, to have a biblical scene which is about the socializing of Jesus. 
right? Jesus getting out there in the world and showing he's just a person and has to, has to exist out there. In the midst of that, of course, one, kind of one of the hardest hits that's, that, that, that he's had up to that point is this moment where he has to say to his mother, I'm growing up. We are not on the same footing anymore. And uh, this, is, this is a tough moment. And of course, the Bible moves awfully quickly after the nativity sequence, which is quite detailed. There is, uh, there is the, move, the moment where Jesus goes to preach in the temple which is duly marked by a church Sunday, and Bach goes to meet that a couple of, uh, three times, I think. There's this event. The events are coming fast. Jesus is out into the, into the world, and he is, he is breaking away, and his, and his ministry is beginning. Um, and, and so in terms of it reacting tellingly to these, to these stages, uh, the composer uh, in, in a church situation like Bach has, has has really both a very, very defined task and a need to react with, with great clarity and, and dispatch. Um, so this piece, really every, everything follows from the understanding of the, of the readings. And of course, uh, the readings, when, when we discovered that in Bach's library, almost nine-tenths of it was interpretive, biblical interpretive, uh, writing assists on how to understand these stories. Um, that would have been his main research uh, help, along with his own, uh, I'm sure, very uh, visceral reactions, very, very intense reactions to these subjects. And we know he was a volatile person. Um, uh, almost all the recent biographies of Bach uh, come back often to his quarrelsomeness. The fact that he's in scrapes with people all the way through his life, uh, really from early to late, uh, that he is contentious and impatient with uh, the standards, uh, with, with reason, but most people who are impatient with the standards find reason to be impatient with the standards. Um, so one of the things I've found is, uh, uh, in, with a sort of journey with Bacchatatas over many years, is is that I become more and more uh, intent on approaching each piece from what I take to be that original standpoint of what is the church day asking from you? Um, what did your last piece about this day do, if you're Bach? Where do you go that you haven't been before? And where did you go well that you could do just as well or better? Um, so the advantage of working in a series like that is like certain painters who, who, who work in series, where they, they have a general structural idea and they then decide to refine and bore down and, and react to certain aspects of it. Uh, uh, Bach, of course, was for the flexibility and the uh, uh, volatility is amazing. And what is endlessly rewarding is how, is how different the different pieces for each church day are often separated by very little time, like a, maybe a year. Um, and of course, there are three, or depending on how you count, there are virtually th three complete calendar uh, fill-ins and a good piece of, four, of a fourth. Um, so that uh, this idea of re-encountering re this text, like the one we just heard read, uh, is, is really a very important part of, of uh, the life of this composer. And quite an unusual life. Um, most people, uh, of course, the end, then the next question is to structure a text which can, uh, can intersect at least or, or, or fit with the church day. And some of the scholarly books about Bach point out how uh, narrow, or narrow or distant these texts are. In the case of this cantata, a, a, a hymn, which, which are an, an already existent hymn, it, verses of that it are a sort of, uh, shall we say, a, f a fortunate, some fortunate congruences with, with the reading. Um, some of it is a little bit more arbitrary because we, we, we go with the sequence of the hymn in, in terms of the sequence of the movements. Um, but really what we're, what we're dealing with here in trying to understand what a Bach cantata is is we're trying to understand how Bach creates a 
a situation of dynamic engagement with his work with what we would call, if we were still back in school, very specific uh, uh, contours of the assignment. Um, the kind of thing that when we're in school is uh, challenging, but uh, against which we, we uh, sometimes chafe or re revel or find uh, difficult because the, the actual parameters are, 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 as we can see in front of us, are, 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 are quite rigorous. Um, so in making these cantatas, which, which sound, I think, usually amazingly spontaneous and engaged from the composer, um, we have a composer who is very, very adept at working with a given. Um, and that, of course, brings us to the whole notion of the chorale, uh, the in her inherited portion of his, of, of his toolkit. Um, most of the chorales, that is the melody that's, that's, uh, that we all sing together at the end of the piece, um, is from a time pre precedent to Bach and is a handed down sort of a really legacy of North German music. Um, and uh, one which he embraces with uh, both idiosyncratic uh, uh, reactions and also very fervent reactions with particular attention to the, to the, the, the most uh, sacred of the chorales, the ones that Luther, the founder, composed. Uh, so, uh, so-called catechism chorale. Um, Craig points out in his uh, notes very, very um, uh, helpfully that, uh, and interestingly, that this chorale in this piece is a, is a favorite of Bach, but of, of virtually no one else. <laughs> um, we know it in, uh, I, I can think of at least three other cantatas where it plays an, an important role, the one that we hear in the first first piece. Um, it, it's just, he, he, other composers apparently just don't find it as, he, as, as alluring as he does. <laughs> and it's the one, it's the, it's that, it's the thing that the basses are singing in slow values against whatever else is going on in that first piece. And that's, it, it comes into, promin into, into considerable prominence in, in other cantatas as well. And it's really, it's just, let's just, uh, attribute to be to a kind of idiosyncratic move of this composer, that he, he would like to elevate it uh, far above its normal status in the Lutheran church. Um, the, the fact that it is, there is handed down material that he mixes with his clearly very uh, alive and contemporary vocabulary is unusual. Um, it, it, it is embraced by some of the composers of that period, for sure, and not all. Um, and for Bach, it, it serves as, I think, a way of him uh, uh, working his way technically through, through almost every, every situation he finds himself in. He'd, if there's not something given, he will invent a given, a, 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 a given element and work against the given. But if the chorale is the given, uh, he thrives because to him it's just then myriad possibilities of harmonizing the same tune. All uh, melodies of all different kinds of pace and, and elaborateness can go against this tune. Um, and the given is to him also a signal that he is connected to not only the founder of his own religion, but, but to a lot of uh, musical thinkers who precede him. Who, whose music he obviously knows and respects. And uh, it goes back to a, an element of musical study, which if, if some of you have, have studied music at school, uh, you may have been put through the, uh, the, 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 the weirdest carryover of the old teaching by the given, which is, which is uh, Cantus Firmus species counterpoint, which I, editorially speaking, had, hated. Uh, <laughs> uh, because there are so many rules and the, and the actual specific specificity of how you work with the given was so uh, punishing 
but nevertheless, it is a carryover and was espoused and, and utterly endorsed ringingly by Beethoven and Schoenberg and composers right up to recent times, providing to those composers and to uh, uh, something like what the chorale was providing to Bach. Bach was, was more fortunate. It, it, there's no evidence that he ever had to do much with spe species counterpoint. But he, from the very young age, was making pieces on, on chorales. And, uh, and those given tunes are uh, very often very beautiful and, and extremely, uh, uh, extremely healthy to be around. Um, so this very piece, I would have to say a little bit about thinking about it. I try, I've done this piece before uh, here. I've done one or two other places, too. Um, I used to I used to look at the first bar and see adagio, which is something we don't see in Bach very often. Uh, it's it's really unusual, um, and it means in terms of the classical period a a really slow and, and probably divided measure. Uh, certainly in Beethoven and, and and even in in some movements of Haydn, adagio is going to be. Uh, a really slow pulse. And in previous times, um, I performed this piece in, in what I call an adagio pulse, in an eighth note pulse. Mm -hmm. This year, I looked at the piece again, and I thought, well, and I'd been reading a little bit of the kind of thing I usually don't read much, which is early music theory. Uh -huh. uh, how did they do it then? What, how did they interpret the words? And I came, I stumbled across a lot of opinion that Adagio did not have in any way that Beethoven or Haydn meaning. Um, and that it was probably not a double pulse. Um, so I thought, if that's true, maybe I should take this, try this historical advice and try instead to conceive the piece in coordinates and in phrases that are moving forward more. And in, there will be a cost in mystery and atmosphere. And I think, I'm hoping there is a gain in the coherence and flow of the phrase. Um, but uh, it has to do with the whole number of elements that go into preparing a performance of music that's been written a long time ago. Because we don't know exactly how people uh, in various term, moments, uh, 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 interpreted the words and the signs, and to that degree, even even the ways of, of inflecting. Um, but it does seem to me uh, that getting rid of the old concept of adagio is, in terms of the reproportioning of the piece, because of course the the first movement is certainly not maybe well, it's a third less long. <laughs> at least, yeah, and it and it loses the sense of stately uh, arrested motion, which, in my mind, in the way began to feel too unusual uh, for the music by the Bach that I knew. Um, but again, one of the wonderful things about performing music, which was written by centuries ago, by certainly by someone whose mind is so various and surprising, you really never know how to set any principles in motion. Um, it is, it is, um, it's exciting to think that, uh, and it's been said very often about Bach, that this, the music is uh, uh, very variously interpretable with, convic with conviction. Um, the, 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 the number of speeds and inflections at which people play keyboard pieces by Bach is, a, is a, a, probably a good example of how much stretch in interpretive value one can, one can, one can apply to this music. Um, however, I do feel that with the, the crux of it is, is how do you convey these words and that's where we have we constantly come back. Um, and the words that the words have to sound like they they belong with what we're hearing. 
And of course, the words of the first uh, chorus are, are, are not poetic words as such. They're not invented uh, as cantata texts. They're the, they're the chorale words. So they, they, they are, and everything is being brought together by a kind of coincidence of purpose from whatever source is, is, is handy. And that's another thing we use. What we often, if we study the wonderful translations that Pamela has been doing for years and years, there will be a source thing at the bottom of where all these texts come from. And sometimes it's really a, a dazzling number of things for one cantata. You think he, <laughs> he just went around snatching from his library, <laughs> pulling this one off, you know, saying this, this will work for this, for this, this piece. And, and coming up with things which were thematic to the story, but were, but were pragmatic to the, to the making of a piece. Um, and uh, of course, the whole question of, of text was probably the longest running and, and most, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, malleable and, and at times irritating problem that Bach had. Um, and we know that his latter years in Leipzig uh, were marked by, uh, first of all, finding for a while a stable librettist that he'd been looking for really his whole life, first time since, since Weimar that he had somebody that he thought was really, really good. Uh, and then working together with a librettist on a piece, which must have been an unusual luxury for him and happened very seldom. Um, and uh, that is obviously uh, a favor to a piece to be able to conceive together. And I think one of the most amazing um, and, and, and really kind, kind of heartwarming stories is the story behind the construction of the Christmas Oratorio, which is a big favorite here, which is the, the result of this Bach and this librettist not only deciding to work together, but taking a whole bunch of good paying jobs in which their main function was to write a piece in, in praise of a duke or a prince who was having a birthday, <laughs> and figuring out how those very same structures would work for a very big piece, which is celebrate the birth of Christ. Um, a, a real collaboration of a very, let's just say pragmatic, because they're trying to make a living, but artistic because they have a great big project which is going to take a lot of planning which they really want is to have as many, many uh, items in place as they can as, they, as they're working. And the, per, and the, the final product is, is the is a amazing result of two men who have figured out how each other think and uh, this wonderful sense of a, of a composer and, and somebody who works with words, um, uh, figuring out how to make a, a piece, work, a big piece uh, work together. I've always loved that the first things that Bach knew f by that librettus was pornography, <laughs> Pub published locally in the Leipzig in these little underground sheets. But he turned out to be a very versatile writer, as we know. I'm um, sure that some yeah. people would like you to mention his name. Cause uh, he's known as Picander. His name is Ernestine. Uh, he lived, really, when you go to Leipzig, you see Bach's house, and Ernesty is just about three blocks away. He's, he, they're in the same neighborhood of Leipzig. And, the, and of course, it, it fortuitously and marvelously in the same neighborhood as Robert Schumann, <laughs> whose music I always think of in the terms of this first chorus. Mm. Uh, there's something about the harmonic world of this first chorus that, that uh, great composers are always jumping into other eras. But that one seems to just sink into some place in the in the sort of wonderful reverie pieces of Schumann piano music. And it also sounds great on the piano. Ah. Those of us who study <laughs> study at the piano. Uh, um, so I think uh, it, the the journey of working on Bach cantatas is really no never never really being in the same ground. Um, Every piece seems to be assembled slightly differently. Uh, and of course, the adventure is the sharing the adventure of a composer who is essentially asked to uh, sort of, in some ways, repeat a task, but do it, do it, do it differently. Um, and in the doing it differently, uh, sometimes the most inspired 
things seem to happen. Um, and I think this piece is a, a perfect case in point. I don't know any piece that sounds like this sano, soprano uh, alto duet. Uh, something about the manic reduction of rhythmic profile and the incredibly magnificent arc that's being spun over something. To perform the piece, we have to be like micro technicians. <laughs> but what the soprano now to sing is like something just dropped from heaven. And that that's a, a way of somehow operating in the compositional realm, which is uh, both very mechanistic, because I think Bach was a, a, a puzzle solver, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, the result being a, something that sounds like amazingly free, freed. Uh, when I visited, uh, before it was broken up uh, and sent to LA, uh, the Schoenberg studio was intact at the Schoenberg uh, Institute in LA. And um, my I had a friend of mine was the head of the Institute and he said, I'll show you all the stuff that's in the drawers that we never really pull out. And, um, Schoenberg, all of Schoenberg's desk drawers were filled with, pu filled with puzzles. Mm -hmm. Really intriguing ones. Uh, some of them were physical assemblage puzzles. Some of them like uh, some word things. Some were just really a kind of just little tiny uh, table puzzles. But that seemed to be his, uh, I guess, his way that he let his mind circulate when he wasn't actually writing the notes down. It made a lot of sense. Um, and it would make a lot of sense for me to, to I don't know this to be true, but that, that box. Uh, puzzle making sometimes is going on on the level of uh, of creating this frame for the soprano and alto and the duet in this piece. You know, that with with these very very few elements that you can you can you can s send something into a, into an arc. Um, one of the things about performing Bach is that sometimes your your task your individual task is extremely routine. Um, and even the practicing of a big Bach fugue, is you, if you don't do the repetitive disciplinary things, you, you will be you will pay for it <laughs> in a moment of tension. Um, and uh, there's something about the, the construction of that that is, is extremely uh, not only lucid and logical, but satisfying that that the uh, that the elements are so uh, have to be so locked in. Um, and I'm sure as a composer that he was aware of this too. We know that bec the, this because of, of the, the kind of exercise books that some of his, uh, his children and students work with that uh, fundamentally, or just if you've ever played the, the two-part inventions in which he explains in the preface exactly why these pieces are as they are and what you're supposed to learn from them. And he, he says they're studies for learning to be a composer, which I think is an interesting remark. I don't know of such a remark by any other composer in, in offering studies, but I know what he means, that if you can do these, shall we say, very sub-compositional things uh, or primitive things, you, you will probably be able to do much more advanced ones. Um, and of course, Bach made the most, I don't know whether he ever made the most frustrating remark ever made by a comp composer, um, but it's quoted from time to time. Uh, anyone can compose as well as I can if you will work as hard as I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really interesting remark. You can believe him to say it because there's a lot of work in uh, what he does. Um, the work has been done. Anybody have any questions about what's been said or embroideries or crazy ideas that bounce? Just a question. Yeah. Please. I don't know what, I, I admit, unfortunately didn't hear the talk about the female voice. Bach, Bach was always very interested in, uh, of course his trebles in his performances were male, were men, and guys, uh, boys. 
But he was very interested in the neighboring city of Dresden, which is a job he always wanted, where the, the singers were female in the opera house, uh, for sure. And uh, he, he clearly was um, uh, he clearly was aware of, in certain textual situations, of the expressivity of the treble register. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and of course, he married a singer. Uh, and uh, he, he, he is, um, along with his other teaching, he did, he did some singing teaching, which is kind of an interesting. I guess everyone uh, had to teach everything. Um, one of the things I love thinking about whenever we perform cantatas is that um, the original performances came out of, uh, out of a high school and college environment. That is, um, all the performers, many of the performers were playing instruments which, which, would, which were uh, fairly new to, to performance. And everyone was being taught as part of a curriculum mm -hmm. in, the, in the Thomas School. Uh, so that the Bach Institute seems to me a direct and happy descendant <laughs> of the idea that that's, that's how these pieces were, were put together and um, probably in a very similar way. Some of the solos sung by people who were uh, newly arrived mm -hmm. and, and instruments, of course, some instruments introduced into the world uh, in that environment. Uh, English horn, for instance, we know probably the first sound of the English horn was in a Bach piece, mm -hmm. public sound. Um, also the same thing with, with uh, teaching the, the people who were there, the students, that, that was there. One of the things that they were expected to do is learn from their, from their docents who were, and of course it's appropriate that Bach's biggest fit of anger was about the effort of his superiors to regulate who he hired to teach. His teaching fellows were to be not hired anymore by him and, and he hit the ceiling because his whole structure was based on the way this, the teaching flow happened from him to the to the to the people who knew how to teach the instrument to the singers, and uh, if 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 the if you don't allow him that, those appointments, he basically can't function, which is what he was saying. He he said it in an intemperate way. <laughs> <laughs> One has to say um, uh, he he wouldn't have lasted very long in American University, <laughs> which is probably not a great compliment to the American University. That's right. <laughs> Any other questions for John? Impressions from this morning's rehearsal? Hello? Text painting, yes. I think if you if you perform a lot of Bach, you um, 
you you inevitably form a, a strong sense of who that composer is you're working with. Um, and he's a he's hard to live with um, because it, his temperament is very categorical. You he presents something which doesn't you, there's not much a, there's no halfway solutions. Um, same thing was trying to master, say, one of the fugues on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, there, 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 there's, there, there's, there's no uh, accommodating or figuring out how to make this more doable. And uh, there's something temperamentally not attractive about that, but but very necessary. <laughs> and uh, and in my imagine my sort of an, an imaginary dialogue that I think I have with every composer whose music I perform. Even even now nowadays composers, I always am in this kind of back and forth about why is it this way? Do, do I have to spend the other you know half hour to three hours on it? <laughs> and and that's I think that with Bach is is something that we come back to over and over. The the people who are performing today had to study their pit, their sit of their parts, and they had to wait until their own vocal equipment and their own experience comes into uh, coordination and connection with what they what they what they're doing and th that meeting place is sometimes a little bit further in the distance than you expect it to be uh, I I had a personal project partly because of work with a festival that we were doing out in Wisconsin of learning to play the entire out of the fugue mm -hmm. and that's a lot of hard pieces and they and they and they ratchet the difficulty of those with the kind of precision. Piece to piece is like, a, you know. And as I got to 17, 18, 19, I think crazy, I just can't do it. But I did feel that the engagement was incredibly valuable in the end because it, the, the compact, the agreement was so solid on, you know, on, on the side of the composer. Mm -hmm. It was like nothing was there just to drive me nuts. It was all there because he could, by extending what he wants, uh, get a different result. Right. Yeah. And I think we hear that in the cantatas too. I mean, people, I think, I know, I know our singers, when they first take an aria home, sometimes they think, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> this time and that, yeah. <laughs> but then, then, you know, you find your way to wherever, wherever the thing is. Even the smallest recit in Bach is a, a, a challenging set of details mm -hmm. and, uh, and <coughs> wonderful, uh, fresh thinking about how to, how to move within the, the, the discourse. And, um, it's not like there is some, something to be said for having done a lot of them, but, but that's not going to help you much with the next. <laughs> Any other comments? Well, then I'd like to thank you very much, John, for this amazing insight. And of course, tomorrow morning is part of the church service. You will get to hear the cantata in order. At, at, at its appropriate place. And then I'd like to also remind everyone of the culminating event at the Bach Institute, which is the showcase concert featuring our fellows in performance, all the music they've been working on for the entire period, 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, and of course, admission is free. So we hope to see you there. <laughs>